Good evening, everybody. So thank you for coming to tonight's Dr. Marvin Small Memorial Parent Workshop Series. There is a new flyer out for the three upcoming parent lectures on the back table, as well as some resources that we have available in our Community Health Resource Center just across the lobby. So tonight's lecture will be saying goodbye to diapers. We have books, um, DVDs that are available to be checked out on the subject. So we would love to have you come and take advantage of our, our books and resources in the, the Resource Center. There's a, a bookmark that lists all of the services available just across the lobby there as well. Um, so I'll hope that you'll take a, a flyer and we'll look forward to seeing you at the, the future lectures. Tonight's Bye Bye Diapers lecture is one that um, parents of all two, three, four, even one-year-olds are anxiously awaiting the information. So tonight's lecture will be presented by a PAMF pediatrician. Dr. Melissa Braverman comes from the other side of the hill, the Santa Cruz Palo Alto Medical Foundation, where she practices in our pediatric department. Um, so a couple of housekeeping minutes. Uh, Details. Just across the, the lobby, there are restrooms. If you look to the left of the hallway, there are restrooms there in that hallway, as well as just outside this door and down the hall. Um, I would ask that you please mute cell phones um, so that we can avoid cell phone ringing during the, the lecture. Also, um, if the, the children are loud, um, we do ask that you please step outside of the room for a moment. Tonight's lecture will be recorded, so I will ask that all questions be held until the end of the lecture. But the last half hour will be designated question and answer, so Dr. Bregman will have a, a chance to field all of your questions then. Thank you for attending, and I will turn it over to Dr. Melissa Bregman. Hi, welcome. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. I know your time is valuable. I appreciate your spending it with us. Um, we are saving the questions and answers to the very end, but as I am most comfortable in an interactive setting, I will ask and have already asked that some of you toward the front, if you feel the need to stretch, stretch with thumbs up just so I know you're out there. Um, it'll keep me at ease. So tonight's talk is saying goodbye to diapers. I first just wanted to acknowledge, most importantly, my patients. They teach us a lot in medical school. Potty training is not a topic which gets a lot of attention, and so much of my learning has come from my patients, and these are all actually my own patients who have given their permission um, for their photos to be shared. Thank you also to Palo Alto Medical Foundation's Health Education and Resource Center, uh, which Jeremy is representing tonight, and to Parents Place um, for their own video series on uh, potty talks. I wanted to get a sense of what's out there in the community and did take a look at those as well in preparing. Additionally, I'd like to thank my mother, who prepared me well for this talk and for life by potty training me. I asked her for a few stories. Uh, I then, upon better judgment and reflection, decided not to share them as this is being videotaped. So you're all here tonight, <clears throat> which tells me that whether you have a toddler now, have had a toddler in the past, will have a toddler in the future, you have probably heard some of these things. I once met a mother named Erica who potty trained her two-year-old son in three days. My kid was fully potty trained at 10 months. She isn't potty trained yet. Yet? Yet? Well, so-and-so's daughter or son is about the same age and they're already potty trained. Maybe you should ask them how they did it. And finally, a personal favorite. I found some He-Man underwear that night. I put them on and backwards, so He-Man was in front and I told him it would not be nice to go potty on He-Man's face. He had two accidents in two days and he was trained. Well, <laughs> if any of you, you know, fits into the first or the last of these categories, wonderful. Have a nice rest of your night. There's a Baskin and Robbins down the street. Um, but if you don't, then I hope that some of what we'll be talking about tonight will be helpful to you. So the reality, that was the buzz. The reality. Every parent-child diet is different, and I know that I don't need to tell you that because either you're just really interested in potty training and a late bloomer and, you know, you needn't raise hands, or you have a child and you know this from every other process you've gone through with them um, and that, that they've been engaged in the learning process of. Um, so I am not here to tell you how to potty train every child. I'm here to give you 
thoughts about successful strategies um, for you to apply to your child with what you know about your child's temperament. Um, not all children are ready to train at the same time, so if you came here for me to tell you how to make that 18 month old ready, I fear that I will woefully disappoint you. Um, but if you came here to hear how to capitalize on your child's interest and how to know when your child is ready, um, then hopefully this is for you. So there are commonalities in how children demonstrate their readiness. And there are strategies that can be successful when you take them in the context of what you know about your child. And you know your child better than I do or anyone else does. So tonight's agenda. First, I want to talk a little bit about recognizing signs of readiness. I want to talk about poising yourself for success, about embracing a Zen attitude, which is perhaps the most important of all of these items, about addressing challenges that you might be able to anticipate and some that you may not, but can hopefully adapt to. I know you can. Um, and then just some important red flags as um, you wander through the various surprises so that you have a sense of what are the things we worry about versus the things that are sort of par for the course in their own variations. And then finally, the question and answer section. So as for recognizing readiness, um, and I want to warn you that the handouts follow very closely the slides. There are a few variations, but I um, can attest that all the content is in there in one spot or another. So first, um, in order to potty train, there has to be a break uh, between your bathroom events. And so one of the most important things is that your child actually does have periods of dryness. That's an indicator of the muscle control that the body actually needs in order to be able to retain and then eliminate. For those of you um, who are changing every however, every however many hours and are fortunate enough to have a child who doesn't get particularly rashy and you're saving a little bit of money on diapers because they can go longer in between, this might actually involve either putting a tissue or a piece of cloth or getting those fancy and even more expensive blue stripe diapers so that you get a sense of how often your child is staying dry um, or checking more frequently so that you get an idea that they're actually able to exhibit the muscle control necessary um, to hold a little bit um, between in particular voids. <clears throat> Who in this room has seen a child do this? So, um, so there are facial expressions, there are signs of uh, removal from activity, there's the particular spot in the house that becomes the poo spot. Um, that's a sign that your child is aware that there's a process going on and has started to glean some social awareness that that process isn't always shared and embraced openly, nor is it always part of the playing activity. And that's important um, because without that recognition, Ain't nothing going to stop them. They're just going to keep going playing while they're pooing. Um, that they experience discomfort. So whether it be the discomfort of anticipation and backing away, or secondarily that, oh, I'm in poo. This doesn't feel good. And so then the, the counterpart to that initial pull away, which is the sort of dance and the tugging and the get me out of this. Um, we all know that our own pleasures and displeasures are powerful motivators. So if you don't care that you're in a dirty diaper, um, then it's going to be really hard to motivate you to do something to keep yourself out of it. Um, that your child can follow simple directions. So it's time to go potty. Please take your underwear. Let's walk to the potty. If your child can't understand receptively that language and can't follow those directions, it's going to be very hard because when you think about the process, which we don't spend much time thinking about for ourselves, um, typically, then you realize how many steps there are and how much time it takes to actually enact all those steps and, and go through those directions. Your child needs to be able to actually remove the clothing. And at first, you can help if you have adequate time. But given how many things are going to have to happen in sequence, um, it's ultimately going to be important that your child actually has a little bit of maneuverability and can help in the process. Your child needs to be able to get to the bathroom. And I would put one asterisk here, which is that there, of course, are going to be um, limitations to mobility in some specific medical circumstances. This is, in general, a toddler who is learning ambulation. Um, it would be most helpful to be at a point where said toddler can actually um, enact the, the will to go to the potty. Um, an interest in wearing big kid underwear, an interest in the potty is crucial. Um, anyone who's met a toddler, uh, you may have noticed that toddlers have their own ideas about whether or not they want to do things. Um, and 
And of all of the things listed here, if your child uh, does not want to do this, that's probably the biggest limiting factor. And the more you push on uh, your will onto their lack thereof, um, the, the more tense the process becomes and the more delayed it becomes. So there are all the rewards in the world that we'll talk about, but very importantly, they need to actually view them as rewards and as things that they want as motivation or incentive. Um, and then they have to have the patience to stay until they've eliminated it. It's a process. Um, and it's easy enough for us to walk to the bathroom and do what we need to do and leave. For them, while they're learning, if they're a child who's on the go, on the go, on the go, active temperament, that's actually part of the process is figuring out what it's going to take in order to get them um, patient enough to follow through with the process so that it's not a setup for failure or just a setup for complete ambivalence. Now, there is uh, the, the lesser spoken about um, corollary, which is recognition um, of the signs of readiness of parent. So <clears throat> remaining dry turns into remaining patient for two hours at a time. Demonstrating awareness of the need to go turns into demonstrating awareness of your own reaction to voiding and stooling. And these are meant to be funny, but really, I think it's important to take inventory of how we think about the whole bathroom process because so much of the attitudes that we instill in our kids have to do with how we feel about our comfort or discomfort around going to the bathroom. Um, experiencing discomfort and wishing to be changed when soiled turns into experiencing comfort and wishing to clean the floor over and over and over as accidents will be inevitable. Following simple directions turns into repeating simple directions over and over and over. Um, the ability to lower underpants and pants turns into the ability to change underwear and pants over and over and over. Um, and the ability to walk to the bathroom is the ability to walk to the bathroom over and over and over. Um, asking to use the potty and the underwear turns into staying enthusiastic about the potty no matter what and buying more and more underwear. And having the patience to stay until child is eliminated is having the patience to stay until child is eliminated. And I bring all of these things up because in all seriousness, um, I think, and we were talking about this earlier, that in our society, we really do have a choice about when children train on our ends. And, um, and from our perspective as grown-ups, it may not always be um, convenient to train at the time that the child is starting to show interest because of all the accidents that are a part of the process. It may be easier to stay in diapers. You have five kids at home um, and one who is in diapers, and that, that's the easiest. That one's not having the accidents. You just change the diaper. That said, it's really all about following kids' cues in terms of ease. Finding a child who's ready and at that point in the process um, that they're showing the interest will make for the shortest training process on either end, whether that means earlier than you're ready or later than you're ready. Um, and it really is important to think about where you are in the process so it's not a stop and start on your end, if that's avoidable. In terms of poising for success, so we take for granted um, how much goes on in the toileting process and in every other process and like everything else in infancy and um, toddlerhood our kids understand so much um, but that doesn't mean it's automated for them and the more automated um, their understanding can become the more they can um, glean from why you're doing what you're doing and what those steps are the better and so really putting into words exactly um, what you see that makes you think that they might need to use the potty, what you feel when you need to use the body is potty is very, very helpful. Um, so I see that you're backing away. It seems like you might need to use the potty. Or I see that you're holding your stomach and that your face is making this expression. Can you feel that it's full in there? Um, teaching your child how to dress and undress. We take for granted. You pull down your pants. Well, what does that mean? First, we're going to undo the snap, then the zipper, and then you push down on those pants. Um, and allowing your child to watch you so that they can model the visual um, prompt is so powerful to kids. As you know from all the other things that you've taught your kids, this can be a real sticking point. And the reason that it has an asterisk next to it is because not all people are comfortable having their kids watch them, and that's OK. Um, I think that there's a natural assumption it makes the most sense to have girls watch their mother and boys watch their father. And I think that probably 
make sense. It doesn't have to be that way at this stage. Um, but having a same gender model makes more sense to kids um, for obvious reasons. They typically have more similar, more analogies in their, um, in their anatomy. It doesn't have to be mom, though. It doesn't have to be dad. If you're uncomfortable, um, then it's just as important that they're not watching someone who feels guarded, uncomfortable, ill at ease, and transferring that um, into their own psyche. It can be an aunt. It can be an uncle. It can be somebody you trust, somebody who's comfortable, a sister, a big sister, a big brother, are incredibly motivating um, in the context of safety, of course. Um, and then reading books, watching DVDs, some of which are um, on the back table and available in the Health Resource Center, are really helpful models for children. I think using appropriate vocabulary is really important. How many of you have thought about how you'll describe what comes out of children's bodies? I know, we told you to hold your questions. Um, so I think it's important, and here's why. Um, we grow up uh, into adults who have certain ideas. Even I, I don't know if anybody caught me earlier, said, said dirty diaper, um, which a lot of people say. When I say it, I hear it because I'd rather that I didn't say it because when we think about voiding and excrement as dirty, we're communicating a certain message and it's something that comes out of our body and I don't necessarily want kids to get the idea that it's dirty. Now, I think about that all the time, and yet it slipped into my lexicon, um, which is because that's how we oftentimes refer to things. But I think it's really important to think about um, what we say to children around our body functions. And so to that end, I think it's important um, to give them the anatomically correct words as we talk about things, um, and also give them words that are easy for them to use. So the words poo and pee are often chosen ones because they're one syllable and they're ones that kids recognize. No matter what word you use, they're going to giggle, um, and that is part of the potty training process that probably would have been, should have been in the slide, um, which is to say comfort with potty jokes, um, and the less you attend to them, the better. Um, and then it's really important as you think about these things that they're really not shaming words or discouraging words words because this is just a stepping stone to their future comfort with their own body and, and what the body does, which as a physician, I'd like them to be comfortable with. Picking a potty chair. Um, so children are so focused on success and failure and so driven to please their parents. They want to be able to do this. Um, however, they could be very shaken were they to actually fall over. So um, there are certain chairs that are more stable than others. Um, so really think about as you're looking at the chairs what a child's going to be able to put their pressure on um, and stay stable on. Handles are nice for holding down during bowel movements. Um, a lot of people ask about chairs, having your own proper potty chair versus a booster seat for a toilet. So I want to do a little experiment, quietly so as not to violate the questions and answer lecture separation. I want you all to try to lift your legs off the ground and, and try to pretend you're having a bowel movement. <laughs> what you may know, you can put your legs back down, thank you. <laughs> Some of you are very good at that. Um, so what you may notice is that as you pull your legs up, and this applies to stooling and to voiding, as you pull your legs up, you actually tense the muscles of your pelvic floor. Anybody who's given birth, which is roughly half the people or more in here, um, <laughs> I infer from your being at this talk. Um, anyone who's given birth knows that you're, you're fostered into positions that allow you to relax your pelvic floor. It's the same thing with passing um, stool and, and voiding. So kids who are hanging and dangling, it's actually hard for them. It makes it harder for them to relax their muscles in order to, to do what they need to do. Um, you can get them a stool, if necessary, to avoid their, um, their feet hanging over the side if it's a situation where they need to be in a booster seat. Um, that little asterisk is to remind me to make a bad joke, uh, which is that at this point, hopefully, you won't have had so many accidents that they're actually using their own stool as a stool. I warned you it was a bad joke. Um, <clears throat> Easy to clean is important for parents. There are plenty out there that could be appealing to your child and also easy to clean, um, which is a real plus. And letting your child select among the good options, again, presuming that they're excited about potty training, which is 
which is an important first step as we talked about, can be huge. As you all know, going to the toy store, going to this, picking of this, choices in toddlerhood are huge. You never want to give a choice that they don't have, um, but if it's a choice that they can make, they'll love to make that choice if they're at the right right stage to do so. Um, and then, of course, considering writing their name on it. Putting your own name on anything makes it better. That's why we love business cards. Um, so I. I have some examples of potty chairs here. I am told, I have gone to the source at the Health Resource Library, I am told that the Baby Bjorn is the one that you must have. No, really what you must have is one that meets your needs and also one that your child is excited about. I just happen to hear that there's some buzz about the Baby Bjorn. You, hear, you can see that it has a handy little shield in the front. Um, no, I'm not a Bjorn spokesperson. There are lots of chairs out there is, is the idea. Potty Feng Shui. How many of you have thought about Potty Feng Shui? Um, so, so people ask, where do I put the potty chair? Where's the right place to put the potty chair? If I put it in the, in the kitchen, are my kids going to think that for the rest of their lives they should pee in the kitchen? Um, so, so this has more to do with your child's temperament and what works in the process um, than it does with an absolute rule. So for the shy child, this is the shy child, um, the child who has started to understand, hopefully not through shaming words, but through the idea that she's noticed or he's noticed that people go to a different place when they void. Um, then having the chair in the bathroom can be helpful to protect that sense of privacy. And also, it can be an immediate step to understanding that this is where elimination occurs, um, rather than in little puddles around the living room or wherever else you should feel so inclined. Um, though that will still happen, even for the shy child. Um, and then for other children, children who absolutely will not stop going, and I'm sure that some, one or many of you have the child who just can't be bothered to go potty because it wouldn't be as much fun as whatever they're doing right now. Um, and so for those kids, it may work better to have it right near the back door um, when they're outside playing so there's less of a struggle for them to, to stop and interrupt and use the potty. And either of these is okay. You're not giving them lifelong malassociations. To stand or to sit if you have a male child. So I'll give you a minute. I can't remember whether I left the seat up on the toilet last night, the cartoon says. So there isn't a right or wrong. Um, I venture to say that none of you, or not many of you, know any adult males who haven't eventually stood up for some of their bathroom function. Um, not that it's impossible, but one way or another, boys will figure it out. Um, so it can be easier just to step to the peeing boys pee in the toilet. It's certainly easier for aim that way. I caution you if they learn first sitting down, that little baby Bjorn shield might come in handy, um, or at least you want to help them and direct them downward. And I say that not for the humor of it, unlike everything else I, I've said um, previously that was an intended joke, but because kids do take it so personally when they fail. Um, and so for them, a sense of a boy sitting down on the potty his first try and shooting straight upward can actually be really traumatic. Um, so sitting or standing is okay. Think through the steps that he'll need to be successful. Um, and if sitting is easier, because that's what he does either way, and because so often when we pee, that's when we really stool, um, either way is fine. Setting an engaging tone. So um, for those of us who are pee shy, <clears throat> I speak hypothetically, um, running water can be helpful. I mean, it really does actually sort of give you a sense. Um, providing an imaginary role model for anyone who's had the child traumatized by the pediatrician. Now, why anyone would be traumatized by a pediatrician? I just don't know. It doesn't make sense. Um, but getting the doctor's kid at home and talking through what it's like when the doctor listens to the heart, to the lungs, to the belly. Same idea. This is what Boo Boo Bear looks like when he goes potty um, can be really helpful and reassuring for kids. Keeping them company, providing them entertainment, again, so that they'll stay there long enough to potentially have some success. Making it fun, target practice. So adulterate your potty from the inside out um, and make a target of it. Make it funny. Most importantly, Anything that's a power struggle, you've already learned if you have a child who you're thinking about potty training because you're in that developmental place. Anything that's a power struggle um, is, is sort of by definition going to be a failure on your, on your end of things. Um, and so, for example, if you ask, do you want to go potty? What do you think the answer is? No. 
Um, do you want to help Mr. Bear go potty? No. Do you want this reward for going potty? No. Do you want this stick? No. Um, so, offering opportunities, let's go potty now. We are going potty now. This is time when we try to go potty. If you are met with resistance, find another approach. You'll do yourself a favor. Um, and to the extent that there are undesirable behaviors, resistance, accidents, etc., the less attention they get paid, the better. <clears throat> Which is easier said than done, by the way. Um, enacting a routine and rehearsal. So do kids list like songs? Absolutely. Do kids like a routine that gives them comfort and consistency? Absolutely. So to the extent that you can automate, and again I mentioned this before, first we pull down our clothing, then we sit on the potty, then we stay here until we're done, unless you're met with resistance, then we wipe carefully, always front to back, then we flush, then we pull up our clothes, then we wash. Make it a song, make it fun. Um, in case you've forgotten, there are these very helpful flashcards. Uh, <laughs> and this, this should be reassuring to everyone here, because if you have the five-year-old who isn't yet potty trained, well, that's why there are flashcards, because they learn to read before they potty train, so they're normal, because some kids are like that. Um, but really, making it a routine and a rehearsal will help for them make your own song. Think about what goes into them. So, um, for children, what goes in must come out sometimes. Um, so, make it easy, and this is particularly on the stooling front. The way that our anatomy is set up, stool sits next to the path that the urethra takes, which is the tube through which we void. If that colon is full of stool, first of all, the, the, the longer the stool sits there, the drier it gets. So whereas the kidneys are genius organs, I don't know if y'all appreciate this, they are brilliant. They figure out how to balance salt and water, and it's just amazing. Kidneys are brilliant. Colon is stupid. So the longer the stool sits there, the more water it will suck out, even if you're already constipated. So if your kids are having a trouble with hard stools, it's going to make it harder for them not only to pass stool, but also to pass urine and to void completely because they're going to have a full colon pressing against a small tube with pressure in the bladder, and it's harder to overcome the pressure if you have stool pressing against that urethra that drains the urine from the bladder. So really thinking about what's coming into their body is important, and if you're having issues with constipation, then that's something that's actually worth addressing with your doctor. We talk about it all the time um, and worth figuring out. So for, and this is Jeremy's forte, he does lots in the community about 5210 and vegetables and fruits and so forth, so kids really should be eating five fistfuls of fruits, their own fistful, not my size fist, um, and five fistfuls of vegetables um, in a day. None of us get that, but we all should be doing it relative to our own fist, fist size. Um, a diet that's high in fiber and whole grains, not starches and simple carbohydrates. Adequate water um, for your average 18-month-old, two-year-old. So 30 ounces of fluid, give or take, a lot of which is water, um, is a good idea. Um, so if you have a child who's doing 16 ounces of milk and 14 of water, that's great. A lot of children aren't, and dairy can be constipating. Um, and then just the importance of really working on constipation so that it doesn't become a, an issue. Anyway, that was a little digression into stool, but that's because it's relevant to, to potty training. Embracing a Zen attitude. So it is hard when your child um, is, is leaving little markers all over your house and, and when you think your cat is closer to potty train than your toddler. Um, it is very hard to be patient, but it is so important. So um, it is okay to have your child help with cleanup. Um, in a very matter-of-fact way, the same as the routine is Hi there. The same as the routine is we pull down our pants, then we sit on the potty, then we wait to go pee, look we're reading a book, seeing how the child in the book does it, then we're pulling it up, then we're washing after we flush. As you go through that, part of that is, oh, if we have a mess, we clean it up. Let's help mommy clean it up, clean it up, moving on. You'll get it next time. Really capitalizing on, I see that you just went poo in your diaper, and I saw you made that expression. That expression 
Did you have a little feeling in your tummy that you were full? You did? Okay, well, great. So you knew that you had to go. Next time you'll tell mommy. Um, <clears throat> believe it, believe it. Um, <laughs> be consistent. Kids need consistency. They need to know that, that if A happens, B happens. Even if they don't like it, they need that consistency to understand the universe. Um, and so try to really think about how you're going to approach the accidents and how you're going to engage them in the process and try to keep it the same. And be patient. It seems so easy to us because we've all been doing it for a really long time. Um, but it's a learning process and there are actually a lot of steps. If you stop and think about how many other things you've asked your child to be able to do almost independently by this age, following seven different sets of directions, actually not that many um, were directly involved at every point in so many other things with multiple reminders and sit down at the table if you don't you'll go into your high chair sit down at the table if you don't you'll go into your high chair that conversation over and over and over um, <clears throat> having had dinner with a toddler tonight. Um, and so similarly, this is a process. It's just a process with high stakes for us as parents. But that doesn't translate into children understanding. And so there's a real chance of the misunderstanding that the stakes have to do with the so-called dirtiness or yuckiness or whatever it had to do with the accident. And it would be really unfortunate if they took that away from a learning process. They took away that they were failing. <clears throat> There are potty charts out there. These, none of these are endorsed potty charts. None of them is produced by Baby Bjorn, to my knowledge. Um, for kids who do like reward and do like the feedback, and for parents who don't find it as natural to describe things um, in such positive ways so effusively, this can be helpful. So I tend to be the kind of person who says, I really like how hard you tried to open the door. That's just me. Um, and that's not everybody. And so if that's not you, but your kids like stickers, then let's give you a sticker every time you try. I would really encourage you not to make the sticker about, or the small incremental reward about success in your parental terms, which is you're potty trained, um, but rather about effort. That said, I am not asking you to get them, I don't know, a new car, um, even a new, a new toy car every time that they try to go potty. Um, you do want to save, if you're interested in doing kind of bigger incentives and your kid is interested in bigger incentives, you want to save those for milestones and they will quickly lose their worth. Um, but for the smaller things, if kids are interested, it can be helpful really just to give them the positive feedback that you appreciate that they're trying and you see their effort. There are all sorts. Not that we're watching TV, we're reading the books because we don't watch TV as toddlers, right? So we don't recognize Dora or Thomas. <clears throat> and these, this is a nice example of sat on, puppy f on potty, flushed toilet, washed hands, really the step-by-step. -step. These are all on the web. Challenges. There are some challenges that I would defy you to avoid. And if you could avoid them, then come on up and take over from here, because they're just so common. Um, so at some point, your environment won't be completely stable. Um, and if you know in advance that there's another one on the way, that there are major changes, you're about to move, you're renovating, et cetera, um, those changes do typically, or at least sufficiently frequently lead to a little bit of regression, though you may not want to set yourself up for that. That doesn't mean you can't potty train, but as you think about a time to potty train, um, realize that it really is a big time in kids' lives, and I would encourage you to think about whether you're ready to deal with that setback amidst the process. Um, if you're planning trips, not just the change of it, but knowing that it's harder to think about bathrooms for kids than we think about. Like when I'm on the road, yeah, I'm getting uncomfortable, getting uncomfortable, wish I hadn't had that last Diet Coke, which I didn't drink because diet sodas are bad for you. Um, but I can hold it, I can hold it, I can hold it. Okay, there's a rest stop in 20 miles. I'm, that's not going to happen with the potty training um, toddler. So you really need to think differently about your trips and actually know where are we going to get to a restroom? Are we within this many minutes of a restroom? And understand that even if you're willing to accept 
child goes back into pull-ups and, um, and that's just how it is for the road trip, that could actually be really detrimental to them in terms of how they think about things. If we build up the success of being the big boy and wearing the underwear, being the big girl and picking her underwear, and then what happens when you're not in the underwear? Does that mean you're not a big girl anymore? Does that mean I'm not a big boy? Did I fail? Um, and so really just thinking about those things in, in advance can be helpful. Even having guests at home, if you have you know, the shy child, um, then what are the implications? If you have the active child who's so engaged with the guest that he or she can't take a break, then that may have implications too. Really thinking about those things and building in a time when you're going to remind about the potty, which may be helpful anyway every three hours. Let's try. Nope, okay, great, um, can be important. Keep as consistent as you can across the environments when you're training. Common challenges. So you will have accidents, and that's a normal part of our learning process. It's um, interesting because when we think about potty training, we think about accidents. And accidents is supposed to be an, an innocuous word. It's supposed to connote that we didn't mean to. But there are a lot of other things that we learn that when we fail to get them quite right initially, we don't talk about failure, we don't talk about accidents, we just say, oh, we're learning that, we're learning. We don't say, you failed to get that part of your alphabet when you're three, you know, A, B, C, F, G, you failed to get D, E. We don't talk about it that way, right? Um, and so accidents are, are a, a term that we use in potty training, but when you think about all the other learning processes that we don't label that way, I kind of wish we didn't label them that way for potty training, um, they may continue overnight for a really long time, and that's physiologic, and that's okay. We'll talk about red flags, but just the absence of nighttime training after daytime training is not in itself necessarily at all a problem. Think about how you will handle the accidents, and I know I'm being a little bit redundant here, um, but really do think, think in advance and think about how you will spare your child the shame of it. If they're at preschool and they don't have a change of clothes, that can be really tra traumatic for a toddler. Um, and really being prepared to deal with them. If you know they have bedtime accidents, figuring out how you're going to deal with the cleanup in the middle of the night, how you can suit their bed to that. Um, Providing opportunities without nagging. Um, being ready mentally, a la the first list we talked about, to deal with accidents in a way that doesn't make them feel like a failure. Rehearsing for lots of different situations. So you're at school and you feel that pressure um, that tells you that you need to go. What do you do? What do we do? Anyone who has older children who you may have tried to teach about stranger anxiety or stranger um, safety issues. So, you know, somebody asks you to take your underwear down, what do you do? Well, you'll train your kids over and over, you'll rehearse. I say no, and I run away, and then you throw just the slightest twist. Okay, well, it's mommy's friend who says take your underwear down. Okay. Um, kids really need that tangible rehearsal, um, and so helping them go through all sorts of situations can be really important. Um, being really concrete, um, and for the children who don't take to the idea immediately that bathroom is for elimination. I pee, I poo, it goes straight into there. There are kids who, I'm sure this will come up in the, in the question and answer section, there are kids who have um, a sense of, of loss at their poo going into the potty um, and, and a little bit of confusion about how this thing that was once part of them then no longer is part of them. Um, for those kids, where they have the accidents, or if that's a sticking point, having them bring it to the potty, bring it in the diaper, put it in the potty. Okay, it's in the potty now. Great. Next time we'll put it directly there. Um, and for the children who did it once and then stopped, kind of take it step a back, back a step, just like we've been talking about, wait till they're ready again. In fact, for the parents who've asked me, we keep we keep pushing at it because he did it once. I've said. Stop for a month. Just stop. Just stop it all, and invariably, kids will come back to it. <clears throat> Easier said than done. Um, so 10% of five-year-olds have occasional accidents, and I don't just mean at night. 5% of 10-year-olds have occasional accidents, mostly at night, but in the day too. 1% of 18-year-olds have occasional accidents, and these are mainly non-pathological, so it's just their muscular turn. Now, at this point, if you're having accidents when you're 18, you're probably asking the doctor whether there's anything they can do and whether you should be worried. Um, but 
more importantly, that's a lot of five-year-olds. Um, and so I just want, I want you to know um, that developmentally, not all kids are ready on the timetable that we may wish for them to be. Um, there are lots of challenges that, that I was just talking about that are kind of to be expected. I wanted to tell just a couple of stories from my own personal experience. Um, just sort of to flavor what you may have seen, and primarily because what do you do when your child takes his first steps? Oh my God, little Jimmy took his first steps and he's only nine months, and you know, then the other parents with the 13 month old who's like, you know, just kind of sitting there, glump, um, are looking down, uh huh, yeah, no, she did it the other day too, really, I swear. Um, you know, are you like, hey, little Joe put poo all over the wall? No, you're like, oh no, no, he doesn't do that. Mm -mm, that hasn't happened. So just a couple of stories. Um, I had a two-year-old in my office, two-and-a-half-year-old, who had been potty trained, had an adorable little infant brother, and now is smearing, was smearing poo everywhere. Mom was thrilled. She was elated. Poo art. She, she said she was going to sell it on eBay. No, she was not happy. They ignored it. It went away. But this happens a lot. Um, Little baby M. So uh, I was over at my friend's house in Hillsboro, and um, baby M was potty trained. He's doing great. No accidents since he was potty trained. Six, eight months. He's a oh, he's sharp kid. In fact, we had a discussion. How early is it, is it um, acceptable to IQ test him for his private school to which he was enrolled? You all have your kids enrolled in private school on a wait list for the most competitive. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, and so, so um, this is one of my more high-functioning and um, one of the friends I am least capable of counseling, I think. Um, so he had been so well potty trained um, until I came over and we were talking about his entrance exams um, and he got really bored. So he peed on their velvet couch. Um, they weren't very happy. Um, and Princess F. So I was actually just at the beach this last week. Um, and this isn't so much an accident, it's just one of the funny things that you'll You'll see happen at some point. I, this is a family of mine who I ran into at the beach, and so I did what pediatricians do in their spare time. They hang out with their patients. Um, no, so I, so I said, hey, what's up? You know, I saw you didn't, you canceled your appointment last week. Everything okay? Um, and then all of a sudden, little Princess F starts stripping and pees right in the middle of the beach. Uh, she got the routine. Very efficient. So your little angel will find some variation thereof, and if your mommy group isn't talking about it, just know that it's okay. The pediatrician says it's okay. These things will all happen. Um, red flags. So I do think it's important to talk about some red flags. So if your child has been continent of urine um, for six months consistently and then starts having accidents, that I would want to know. Um, if your child has a marked increase in the amount of peas in a day, urinations, that I would want to know. If the urine smells terrible and there wasn't asparagus in the diet and, and you're not on antibiotics for an ear infection, um, then I want to know. I want to know anyway, but those are two notable exceptions to when foul urine odor can be par for the course. Um, if the urine stream is narrow and dribbly and never forceful, that's worth knowing. Um, and maybe something you only find out once your child's potty trained. Cloudy um, or pink urine or blood stains, bless you. Um, daytime wetting, again, what I mean is daytime wetting after being trained, because nighttime wetting is so much more common. Pain or burning with peeing. Um, and if you're child is still urinating at night by age six or so, then I want to know just because I want to make sure that there's not something else going on besides my child needs more time. Um, again, constipation. So um, when children are withholding stool, um, they can actually kind of grow the size of that not so intelligent colon um, so that it's not as stretchy and so you can build a problem that you didn't initially have and it can, it can uh, worsen over time. Ways to know that your child is doing this, you will notice, hmm, well when she started potty training she never seemed to want to go to the bathroom for poo. Um, you will see prolonged pushing, hard stools, bleeding, um, really a, a great amount of discomfort with stooling and psychological um, stress with that, or just a change from their normal frequency of stooling. Ultimately, for the most part, if stool comes out soft, whether it's every day or every three days or every seven days, that's fine. But if it's a big change, your child goes every single day and then doesn't go for a week, then that's a flag for me. And um, 
some common questions and answers that I just thought I'd address up front. Which comes first, the pee or the poo, um, or the urine or the stool? So oftentimes urination comes first in the potty, um, but oftentimes stooling is mastered first. Um, the process of urination is easier. Once you get it down, it just kind of comes out, you pee, you're done. Um, stooling takes a little bit more coordination and it can take more time and patience. Um, but once you've got it, you're not dribbling on either end typically. It's sort of an event and you're done. Um, boys and girls, so your child is, is a person, not just a gender. Um, it is probably true that on average, boys might take a little bit longer as a population, um, but there are boys that train early and there are girls that train late. How long does it take? Three days, didn't you see the comment at the beginning? <laughs> um, it depends on whether or not you follow your cue, their cues. Again, if you're here for me to tell you how to get that 14-month-old trained, um, but your 14-month-old isn't ready, or you're here to tell me to get your three-year-old trained, but your three-year-old isn't ready, um, that's what's important. Are they ready? If they're really ready and they're demonstrating all those signs that we talked about, six weeks is sort of an average. Um, faster has happened. Three days has happened. It's happened lots of times. Longer has happened. But the most important part is um, the, the more ready they are, the shorter the overall duration will be. And every child is different. Every child's a different person and will um, progress at his or own, her own pace. And then again, nighttime accidents can continue to occur. Um, so that is my presentation. Um, couple of other references. Great book, which I think is on the back table, is the American Academy of Pediatrics book about potty training. I tend to like their series for parents about a lot of different things. And I don't know whether there's a, a pause or a brief intermission for stretching or, or how we proceed from here with questions and answers. So I'm happy to jump into questions and answers. Thank you everyone for your attention. And if at any point anyone needs to leave, please feel free to do so. You are not my, my hostages. What's that? You, and if anyone needs to take a potty break, um, so long as you don't need my help in doing so, you're welcome to, to go ahead. And I will repeat questions to make sure that they are captured. I have a question. Uh, which one do you suggest uh, we need to use, like, pull-ups or uh, use just normal cotton underwear but during the training period or just leave them with nothing when they're at home? So the question was um, whether my recommendation would be for cotton underwear, pull-ups, diapers, naked. What do you do when they're learning? So I think there are some practicalities. If you are not equipped to deal with accidents, um, then that may require that they stay in pull-ups or they, they stay in an accommodation that will work for your shag $10,000 carpeted home or whatever your circumstances may be. Um, that said, thinking about the process, they do need to be able to learn how to take their clothes down, as we talked about. But the, in terms of the haste with which they'll need to scurry to the potty and get all of those steps accomplished, being naked is certainly easiest. Um, and I don't think that there's really an issue of confusion. They won't think that the rest of their lives will be spent naked. So in a lot of ways, having them naked um, can facilitate, so long as they are otherwise ready and not upset to be naked, um, that for many people can make it easier to get child to potty and to get success, which is so important to build on for kids. Um, in terms of cotton versus pull-ups, I think that um, pull-ups are a brilliant capitalist scheme in my mind. I mean, think about it, right? You call them something else and you just fashion them a little bit differently um, and you pay more for them, um, but your child still is really going in a diaper. Um, so I, I think that um, pull-ups are very absorbent, so um, Many children will stay comfortable in pull-ups for longer than they'll stay comfortable in underwear, which is not to say that I would encourage making your child uncomfortable, but if they are ready in every other way except being bothered by sitting in their excrement or their void, then putting them in something that facilitates their noticing it can be helpful. 
if you can cope with the accident. For other children with their temperament, and I know this is a very wishy-washy answer, but your children really are individual people, for some children having failures in their pretty underwear can be upsetting to them. So I really would take their cues and see where your issue lies and navigate that way <laughs> if they're not all running around naked. Um, I see someone in purple. And so, and then, honey, she goes, and so, um, our four-year-old girl, we've tried several times, and then, you know, we've had step out of the break, and so, um, the interesting thing is she will willingly sit on the potty, and we've tried to look as well as potty underpants, and, um, when she's not wearing anything, and she's, she's urinating, she'll scream as if it's burning her, like, acid on her legs, and it might be splashy. She's a very sensitive with several sensory conversions. However, when one time she had her cotton underpants on and then she peed and she was proud and happy and you know she said I did it. So it's as if she's wearing the cotton underpants and the pee's going through it, that's okay for her. But when she feels the pee coming out of her without anything on, then it's very traumatic to her. So um so we have a question about a family who's raising an entire army of small children who aren't potty trained. Um, and and, and uh, whether there's a, a role for them. No, so, um, so this lovely family, this lovely intolerant family has a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a one-year-old, um, all of whom are... Well, sorry, and one, one on the way, one on the way. Congratulations. Um, so so um, all of whom are in, let's say, different stages of potty training. So for a child who has sensory integration issues or certain sensitivities, um, then that moves us into a realm where I think a little bit more creativity might be necessary to try to answer briefly some thoughts that I have about that. One, mom is commenting that peeing through the underwear seems to be okay, which makes me wonder whether there's something about it leaving her body that is uncomfortable for her mentally, what is this loss that she's experiencing? Because it doesn't sound like it's truly a sensation on the legs, which I imagine she gets not entirely differently when the underwear is on. If that's a thought, then that might be somebody that I would encourage to take her underwear off afterward, which she may or may not have tried, and encourage her to become part of the process of putting her wet underwear into the potty and then congratulating her for going potty and putting the, the pee where the pee goes or whatever your words are. Um, and getting her involved in that process. Um, you, I'm thinking about creative other things. You could have the underwear that she puts on when she pees and then that she puts on when she's dry and she sort of puts on a different pair when she pees and then puts those into the potty to get some separation. Okay, the, this is what ultimately goes into the potty, but these are the ones that I wear around and I keep dry. Um, and another thought is if there is actually a sensation issue, um, I would want to make sure for a child who's having issues with um, discomfort while passing urine that it really isn't an organic issue. There are two things that come up. One is urinary tract infection, but the other is vulvovaginitis. Now, it doesn't sound as much like that to me because I would imagine typically through underwear you would feel that too. Um, but just for your knowledge, vulvovaginitis, which is irritation of the actual vulva, which is right below the urethra, um, can occur because of bubble baths, because of chemical wipes. Kids can get sore and then urine passing um, can be painful, not because there's an infection on the inside, but because it's a warm fluid with a particular pH balance or imbalance that's striking irritated skin. So you want to make sure that that's not the case. You could try putting um, something that weren't a cloth barrier ritually on there, depending on her temperament. Well, before you go pee, we'll put a little Vaseline on there. That should make a difference, um, something that's not the underwear. And then finally, for kids who don't do have vulvovaginitis, and this obviously um, may not work in terms of changing the mentality around the process of potty, but having a child pee in the water to get used to the idea that it's gone and out of her body may or may not be helpful somewhere in the equation. So those are some ideas that I would start with. And then your pediatrician who knows your daughter may or may not have um, other kind of brainstorming things to creatively get around what sounds like it might be a little bit of a mental block. 
And I saw, I think you had your hand up in the front. I know you mentioned earlier in some discussions about standing for boys so would you then have a toilet to sit down in the chair and sit down and have a stool available and stand up? Because our son is with me whenever I, I go, so he, he gets the idea. I don't think he's trying to actually do it yet, but I think it might be confusing for him to say you know, we're going to here. So the question um, was on the topic of standing versus sitting, and would you actually establish a separate um, environment potty, one with a stool, one without, if you were going to pee standing versus sitting. Um, I, think that, I think that I would pick one, which you may already have done, and, if, and I would pick one and teach him that that is the way we're going to pee for now, rather than picking different environments. So um, if he has a potty where he stools um, or has started to do that, and sitting down is physically what maneuvers better, and he understands that, then I would do that. Um, if he wants to be like daddy and wants to do it, then I actually think it's fine to do it in the same potty if it positions thematically in whatever way you need to, but I would keep it one way or the other when teaching him to pee. Was that your question or no? Yeah, I kind of just meant like if he has a chair, like a potty chair, would we then have him stand to pee there as opposed to standing to pee? You would have him try, so the question is, well, well, if he has his own potty chair, would he pee into the potty chair? Then you would try to have him pee right into his potty chair. I had a question in the back. Yes, <clears throat> my son right now, uh, like a couple of days past, every time he sits in his bathtub, his middle bathtub, he pee. Is there a sign of he's aware of what he's doing or he's like for fun? Just like the moment he sits in the bathtub, he starts pee. We're like a couple of days in a row already. <laughs> well, um, so it depends how old, the question was, um, So, so mom has a 25-month-old who's discovered that it's fun to pee in the bath. Um, so so um, the bath is a relaxing place in general. Warm water is very soothing, um, which is why Santa Cruz has popularized the idea of the home birthing tub and trying to integrate that even into the hospital environment. Santa Cruz. Um, so, so um, it may be that that's just relaxation of his muscles and he's been holding it longer in between events such that now when they're relaxed and that's encouragement, he goes. And that's a routine time and so you're seeing a routine fall into place just like he's hungry at the same time every day. What I would ask to you in turn is whether he's demonstrating other signs that he's able to hold it for a period of time um, that he acknowledges when it's going to come. And at 25 months, I guess I'm wondering whether he's um, verbal enough um, if he's kind of reaching milestones at a time we might expect to ask him, what did you feel just now? Do you know? Without any shame, but it looks like you just peed in the bath or whatever your words are. It looks like you just urinated. Did you feel something in your tummy? And actually asking him what exactly he's experiencing and what he's noticing and trying to build off that. Okay, yeah, he, he right now, every time after he poo, he will tell me he did, mm -hmm. but not before. But I can tell mm -hmm. his face. But he has a facial expression for a while, like a long time ago. But, mm -hmm. but afterward, he will say, and that's great. So if your child announces afterward or if you discover in the bath, work with that. Um, he needs to have the other signs in order to be in order to be able to progress without it becoming a power struggle. But you can encourage those other signs of readiness by verbalizing to him, I see that you just looked uncomfortable. Were you feeling something right down here? Where were you feeling it? Did you feel full like you needed to poo? Because you pooed. Great, that's fantastic. Look, you noticed your body knew when you were pooing. Maybe next time you can feel that sensation and think, Mom, and tell me. Same thing with peeing in the tub. I guess I would first just ask him. I'm a huge fan of talking to kids because they understand so much more that they, than they can express without being guided and asking what your child is feeling and then trying to build that into what you're teaching him about what he's feeling. And then I see a question behind. Yeah, your slide you said that um, it's more about activity level than gender in terms of readiness. Um, what did I say? Uh, FAQ? Yes. Sorry. 
So um, to clarify, on this slide I said it's more about activity level than gender. Um, so a lot of the thinking about why boys versus girls are on slightly, on average, different timelines population-wise, a lot of the thinking is about just how motor-driven boys are. So when we talked about the shy child versus the, the um, active, everywhere, I don't care child, a l not all the time, I'm not making broad stereotypes, um, but to the extent that there's some truth in that, the thought in part is that boys are motor-driven, exploring, climbing, cracking their head open, doing all sorts of things that you didn't intend for them to do when you pushed them out of your body or had them removed from your body in a pristine state, um, that, that those boys are so active it's hard to get a break in for them to potty train. That's the thought. So also, like one of the things was that their readiness is that they're patient enough. So at what age do I usually talk Because I don't think my daughter's so um, the question is, when will my daughter be patient enough to sit there and pee or poo? Um, if you can establish that your child is ready in all the ways we talked about, and um, you can set up a positive environment that's fun with teddy bear and books and um, watching DVDs and you're a big girl and rewards and all of those other things, um, then then. Patience may just be the patience to try for a minute or two every few hours. I don't, I don't have an answer for when your child specifically will be patient for long enough, but the more entertainment you can provide in the context of everything else being positive and set up for the routine, the longer you're, you're going to be able to keep her there and engaged and trying. I'll take one from here, then the other side of the room to, to share. So I might already answer my own question, asking you a question, but um, acknowledging the fact that you know some kids work better potty training being all naked for three days or having you know big boy and girl underpants or whatever. I've seen potties at the park, like where parents bring the potty there. So that obviously is taking the six week approach of like wherever we are, if you need to go, we will be there to support you. Are there pros and cons or just whatever's right for your kid? Anything to look out for there, depending on what approach we try with our kids and what works. Um, I think so. The question is um, that that the idea of your own porta potty, literally. So, um, so do we bring the potty to the park? Um, do we support him or her at all costs? Um, so. I think the idea of bringing the potty wherever is a great idea in theory. There are some practical limitations. So um, practical limitation number one is just as with your dog, you would bring um, something to pick up after your dog. Um, your child uh, and, and your child's excrement is um, unfortunately similar to a dog's in that regard. Probably better to have somewhere to put it than to dump it on the ground afterward. So you'd have to have the place to put it or a way to transport it. Um, and in, in the sense of um, propriety over the body, I think it's really important to communicate to your child at some point, this is what we do. We're going to do this in this private area. And without giving your child a psycho pathology, um, do a little bit of just visual indication that this is a semi-private function, um, but an okay, healthy one. Um, not like throw a tarp over them, but you know, here, mommy and daddy will sit in front of you, okay, great, um, or something a little bit better suited to allow you to actually help them. Um, and then I, and this is so not pediatric, this is just me. I'm so apprehensive because I wish we didn't live in the society that we live in, and so I, would, I just really would want to make sure that it was a safe environment for the kids. But so long as those things can be accomplished, um, then I think bringing it where the kids are gives them more success, and I think, that's, I think that would be great. But I think it would be great for consistency, but not necessary if you're not comfortable, because again, if you're not comfortable, then that's going to communicate to them. And incidentally, I believe there's another pediatrician in the crowd who I will not ask to comment or anything. Okay, so um, question from over here. Um, what if your kid is in daycare, and so then, because uh, you, you want to be consistent and you want to have your sort of potty values, you know, and potty manner, you know, and then the nanny's like, well, this is what I, this is how I potty train, you know, 
and you're kind of like, well, I, I hope it's positive and, and loving, you know, so they have, feel good about their body experience, their, you know. Is, how do you, how do you, you know, do that? They have two different approaches to potty training. Would that be okay? Um, so the question is, well, what do we do if our values, our approach, our developmentally friendly, I went to the lecture, this is how we're doing it, doesn't mesh with another caregiver. Um, that's always hard, right? I mean, that, that can apply to potty training, what foods your child eats, how they play with others, what the rules are. I think that from my standpoint in what, and I know this isn't quite your question, but just to put it out there, in what you communicate with a caregiver. I hope you all have relationships with your nannies or preschools where you feel like you can articulate things that are important to you in terms of the, the rules and the environment you want for your child. And I think it's fine to say, this is really important to me. And these are the bare minimum fundamentals that I really think are important, not necessarily every element of, but this is how she feels comfortable and these are the words we use. Um, and we're, we're really careful that we don't punish for X, Y, Z. Um, I think it's reasonable to articulate the, those and, and ask for them to be um, honored. In terms of explaining to your child, um, for anyone, for example, who comes from a split home, the analogy comes up to me, it's really difficult for children to understand inconsistencies. But if there are discrete inconsistencies that you notice, then I would actually pay a lot of attention to them. Ask your child about them. Ask the caregiver about what isn't practical in terms of how they enact the process versus how you do. And then I would do the best you can in an environment that's dichotomous in a way that you would ideally have it not be. I would do your best to say, when you're at school, this is the rule. When you're with nanny, this is how we do it. When we're at home, this is how we do it. They don't necessarily need to understand why. If they ask why, answer them as simply as you possibly can. Well, because there are a lot of kids at school so it can't be done the same way. There's just you here. We can do it this way. Well, because come up with simple answers and stick to them and understand that it is harder to learn two routines, but two discrete routines is better than, I'm not sure, I don't understand, sometimes it's this way and kind of a, a lot of overlap and confusion. That would be my best advice. I think it depends. The question is whether the um, inconsistency would prolong the training. It depends on the child. In general, inconsistency will make things take longer if it's an important inconsistency. So for example, an unimportant inconsistency may be we have a potty in the kitchen at home and a potty in the kitchen at daycare. That's probably not that important. They get it. It's in the kitchen. OK, this is my potty here. This is my potty there, um, if they're otherwise ready. But there's a potty in the kitchen and as soon as I say potty at home, mom takes me to the potty and she helps me get my pants down versus there's a potty in the kitchen at preschool but I have to wait seven minutes. Not that they, if they can tell time before they're potty trained, awesome. Um, no, but, but you know, I waited seven minutes, I looked around, I was stressed out, I was thinking I really have to go, I have to go, why isn't anyone taking me potty and then there was pee dribbling down my leg. That's a really important inconsistency. And so um, there, it, it depends on how concrete or intangible that inconsistency is in terms of how much delay it would lead to. Trying to see if there's anyone who hasn't. Um, and they go for back of the room in the multiple blues and whites. That's you. Hi. So I have a 14 month old, and she's been um, she's been pooing in her body <coughs> almost from the first the minute she hit one. And it's not intentional. Uh, it just she just took took to it really well. And um, giving her the time that she want, if she's comfortable, she does it. And she indicates, she says, poo when she wants to go and poo, and she does it in the body, thank God. But uh, now recently I started to see that when I try to put her in a diaper, she's, she's not comfortable. And she says, when she pees, when she's pooping and she pees, she says, pee. And I thought it's too early, I don't even have to, I should not, you know, stress her about that. But is the question whether that this is okay to move forward? Yeah, so yeah. I mean, I don't know if I can, if I can train her to her pee also, or what do I do next? I don't really know. She's, she's 
not walking yet. So um, the question is, first of all, this woman needs witness protection um, because her 14-month-old her has um, been stooling for a period of time already um, and is aware of it, does this in the potty, and now is expressing interest in, in urinating in, at the same time, or at least describing the process of urination when it's occurring with pulling. Go for it. But what do I do? Like, do I, she's, not, she's not walking, and so she's still kind of pre-walking. So and do I just leave her in the diaper and make, take her and make her pee every two hours, or how do I go about it? If she is already showing an interest, um, and I understand now more the question, which is that she's not ready in every regard. Um, she's ready really only insofar as she doesn't want the diapers anymore. Um, so that's a tough, that's tough because of all the messes and the parental readiness component. Um, I would say if you are in a position to offer her every few hours that she sits, then I would do that. You're not putting that on her. You're facilitating for the piece that's not there yet. Um, by waiting, you may see that she gets more and more uncomfortable, or you may see that she actually acclimates and gets accustomed to being in it and is less bothered, and you kind of miss a window and get a later window. So I would say if you are in a position, even if she can't do all of it, but she, most importantly, her brain says, I don't want to be in this, and she's actually dry for a period of time, even short periods, I would offer her the potty. You're not pushing on her, you're offering on her, if you can do that. I to her all the time. I'm, I'm staying at home all, so I just I keep talking to her all the time, and I keep telling her that you're peeing. Okay, this is, this is your poo, your peeing. And this was like from a long time, so now she knows that this is pee, -pee and I'm peeing in the potty. And she just wants to get, and I put the diaper on, she doesn't like it, and I'm like, I don't know what to do. I think if you're in a position to offer her the, the intervals, um, then go for it. I think that's great. So the question is, do I do diaper, do I do pull-ups? If, if you are able to cope with having her naked around the house, she might be the perfect child to do that because you already have the limitation around her not being able to physically get herself there, so you're one step closer. Um, and if, and for her, pull-ups might be, if, if she has a different association with them, that it doesn't impede her learning because she's already not wanting to be in a diaper, that might be something that she is acceptable to her, but I would definitely still try to encourage her periodically because she's showing the interest and it's so important to capitalize on that. Um, Oh, I'm going to go to Jensen. I know, I'm trying to hit people who haven't asked questions yet. Um, I don't think you've asked, and then we'll, we'll go back to you two ladies. Well, I have a 13-year-old girl, and uh, I was thinking of waiting to start body training until she was two, because I have a, I'm a month old, uh, girl, uh, girl, at least I'm a month old. And, uh, but my mom came to help me first, because it was a section for the second one. And she got a cute uh, potty training. Potty, potty like, looks like a miniature of the real one, and even sings, etc. And she started taking her. So I didn't, I couldn't say no. So uh, my girl goes and actually she pees and poops some time. So I started following what my mother started. But my question is, how long or how how much time is good? Still good enough? I mean. 15 minutes or, or more, how much time would be healthy for her to be sitting there? So the question is, how long is it healthy to have a child sitting on the potty trying? And the answer to me is, the length of time that the child's comfortable being there and isn't coerced is engaged. So while I could offer you an answer like, five minutes because you're not going to pee if you haven't peed in five minutes. That's not entirely true. You maybe weren't quite ready because I know probably most of us not ready to pee now in two seconds, boy, I got to go. So I don't think it's as much about the period of time as is she engaged? Is she reading books? Is she happy there? And I think um, I would offer her at least five or ten minutes unless she's unhappy, but if she's happy longer, that that's okay. 
as long as it's not a, a coercion to her. <laughs> so, by mandate, every toddler shall have an iPhone. It shall have a potty DVD playing on it at all times instead of Yo Gabba Gabba. Um, question from, oh, I think you had your hand up before in pink, or fuchsia, or whatever shade. My two and a half year old is the one that won't stool in the toilet, and um, I got the part of putting it from a diaper into the toilet, but anything else that we can do to try to help him. And he's always had a constipation problem throughout his whole entire life so far, so that's probably not helping any but So, question is, um, toddler who won't poo in the toilet, but pees, it sounds like. Um, we know we're going to put the poo in the diaper and have have the actual child help you bring the poo from the diaper. Um, will My first question is, um, will your child actually sit on the potty with the diaper on and poo? I don't know. So He gives me all the cues that he needs to go poo, but he... I'll say, do you want to go use the potty? And he, he doesn't want to. He wants to use his diaper. Okay. And then if we're changing the diaper, it's, I pooed in my diaper. He's excited about it and not in the toilet. And it's like, no, you're supposed to go to the toilet. <laughs> so number one, um, I will kind of correct the, the cardinal trap we all fall into. Do you want to go poo in the potty? Nope. Yeah. Um, so I would try to rephrase that. You need to go poo. Thank you for showing me that with your elusive face and your evasive stance. Um, now we're going to go try in the potty with a sticker at the end. Some Not coercion, assuming he'll allow you to do that. Um, and in terms of, of, of his actual pooing, so he's excited, he knows he's pooed, and you build on that and you tell him, great, I know you're hearing the same things over and over, but great, you told me you pooed. That's so fantastic because you understand your body. You knew that you went poo. Next time, I want you to tell me when you feel like you need to go because you feel what you feel and you talk about what you feel and you need to go poo. And you don't need to go on the potty. We'll just sit you on there with your diaper. We'll leave your diaper on, okay? Um, bring the potty to him. Oh, you need to go poo right now? Do you want to put it in the potty when you're all done, or do you want me to? Um, and aside from those things, depending on his situation with the constipation, that needs to, that needs to be addressed. That's worth addressing with your doctor. Um, because if you can get the poo to come out easily, um, then, then you are much closer to actually being successfully trained. Um, and really making sure that none of your efforts have been counterproductive in how much attention you We're not pressuring him, but I, I think we've tried everything you just said, except, I mean, we've even got like big money rewards for him to go poo. Go poo and you get this, come on, you know? But, you know, like we don't pressure him that much, but it's, you know, even we're like, come on, let's go potty, let's go potty, let's go potty. No, 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 no. He wants to do in his diaper. Have you asked him why he wants to poo in his diaper still? Uh, and I've talked to him about everything, and he just, that's where he wants to do it. He, it's like an ownership thing for him, I mm -hmm. guess. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I wonder what you might be able to replace his poo with. <laughs> like, <clears throat> okay, well, you get to own the process of putting the poo from your diaper into the potty, and I don't know what it's going to be for him. You've stumped me. I don't know what it's going to be for him, um, but the ownership issue sounds like an important one. And for some kids, that is. That's a loss. I would get him as engaged in the process as you can and then ask him to tell me when you're ready. Do you think it would be beneficial for him to be naked so that it's not going into the diaper? Yes, I might have to clean up the messes, but at least it might want him to go. Um, in terms of whether having him out of diaper will help with that, if he's aware of his pooing and volitionally not wanting to put it in the potty, my only concern would be with him being naked, with him holding it, which can actually make things harder because, again, the, the ignorant colon will continue to suck water out and make it even harder the next time. I, would, I think I would favor an approach of him sitting on the potty with his diaper, of him personally being the one to put the diaper in there. I've heard um, you know, one approach is, is it that 
it needs to stay cradled in the diaper. So can I put the diaper in the potty and you poo into the diaper in the potty in a smaller, smaller square? Um, what is it about that process of not wanting to lose it? Can you make a ritual around saying goodbye to the poo? This was a part of me, it's not part of me anymore. There are people laughing, I do this every time I stool. That's normal, right? Um, so, so making a ritual of goodbye. This was part of your body, and tomorrow there'll be another part of your body that, that now you, know, you have space for. And making that something that you celebrate and talk about rather than, rather than sort of try to work past. Those would be my, my best thoughts. Uh, yes? Um, I have a question about my two-year-old son. He's pretty independent compared to my four-year-old daughter. You know, he'll even, he's two going on four days. He'll help her put on her shoes, and she'll just sit there with her legs out. So regarding the, the readiness signs here, he's showing all of these where she is kind of dizzy on a couple of them. So do I kind of stop with her, work on him, and maybe the sibling rivalry or, you know, the fact that she, <laughs> she might want to work. They all want whatever each other has, but then I don't want her to feel shameful or bad about herself, like, oh, mommy gave up on me, and that she tore from him with brother. So, but he showed signs. But then when she's screaming, he doesn't want to go on the platform because he's doing it. She screams when she leaves. Okay. Which one do I pick? Okay. So, um,. The question is from the four-year-old, two-year-old, one on the way, um, how do I stage a fight club wherein my children, no. Um, so the question is, um, how, how do I negotiate a four-year-old who is not entirely there with the process, process of potty training and has some specific barriers? Um, how do I negotiate that with a two-year-old who's showing signs without picking one child over the other, setting up rivalries, et cetera? Um, or how do I best utilize said riv rivalries? So um, I would say this. You never want to you never want to pick one over the other. And in some way, to not capitalize um, on his readiness would be picking her in, in my mind, because even not making a choice is making a choice. So I think instead, um, as you move forward with two, now three children, there will be all sorts of opportunities to make sure that each child feels that his or her talent is um, fostered and honored and, and um, nourished. And so I think to the extent that um, you can have your daughter help her brother we're massaging reality a little bit here, um, but help her brother. She already has her potty. Now he's going to start working on it because he wants to, um, rather than explicitly talk about how, well, we tried with you. We're going to try over here instead. Not at all. But also find something right now that's parallel that she's able to do that he's not doing and really talk to her about what a great job she's doing with that thing that she's doing and that eventually she'll be able to teach brother how to do that and really give her her own different thing. I think that it's appropriate to move forward on his cues but make sure that all of your um, conversation, all of your communication is about how each of your children is different and how you love them each for all of the different things that they're interested in and they bring and how that's life and how wonderful that is while you get embarrassed and hope that she learns from her brother. Um, and trying to separate those environments um, to the extent that you can so that if it is traumatic to him to see her, then you can do it at different times. It doesn't have to be together and they can have their own separate potty environments and that would be okay too. Um, but give them each something to, to be proud of. And I'm gonna go to, have we talked to you white in the corner yet? No, I've seen your hand, so let me answer you and then we'll get back to you. Can you give me some idea how to do potty training during the night time? Oh, there's always someone who asks about potty training in the night time. So um, the question about potty training in the night time, um, I need a little bit more information, which is are we talking about um, a child who's already potty trained during the daytime, and for how long? How old is this child? Three and a half. And how long has um, three and a half year old been potty trained in the daytime? Yeah, he can go by himself. For months, for for several months. So, nighttime potty training is hard. Um, it's hard because physically. Um, 
children may have more or less tone in the sphincter that actually holds on in particular to their urine during the night. Um, and, and they may also have differences in how well they perceive the need to go overnight. So um, the reality may be that it may be quite some many months or even years until you achieve perfection. Um, and it could be several months until you achieve occasional accidents only. Um, really helpful, just basic things, which I'm sure that you've, you've already thought about. Um, making sure that, that the last beverages that um, he, it's a he, you said he, that he has um, are three hours before bedtime. Because um, for all of us, if there's something in our bladder, we're setting ourselves up for failure. Um, if you are um, at a point where he can um, lay in bed and sort of tighten muscles and kind of think about tightening his muscles. That's something that works a little bit better for girls. Um, but it can help him to think about kind of keeping his muscles closed and trained. At that age, I'm not sure that's something that's going to be real helpful for older kids doing little practice exercises of kind of tightening those muscles and getting used to how that feels can help. Um, overnight, if there is a time when a child always has nighttime accidents and you can isolate that time, so if it's just once during the night and it's at 2 in the morning and you can figure that out by wake him up at 4 a.m., nope, he's wet by 4, wake him up at 3 a.m. the next night, nope, wet at 3, wake him up at 2, yep, it happens at 2.15. Um, if you can isolate it, your best bet for a young child is if there's some consistency, you go, you wake him up, you take him to bed, you put him back, because he may just not be physically ready for that. Um, there are alarms and things. We don't typically use those till kids are older because they take some ownership over them and they really don't effectively work um, with the younger kids. And so at that I would, age, I would say to the extent that you're able to, it's, the onus will be on you until, as long as you remove the, the impetus by taking away the fluid right before bedtime, but the onus will be on you to try to isolate that time and then get him out of bed. Okay, thank you. Okay, it's okay for like uh, you start party train um, and then you have to take a trip and then you put diaper on again, back again. Is it okay? Or? So the, the question is, I think will it be confusing or will it cause regression um, to, to take the, the grown-up underwear back and put the diaper back on for a trip? The answer is different for every child. Um, for a child who's highly success driven, who's highly invested in what mom or dad thinks and, um, and, and has gotten a lot of pride derived from the success in training, that could be really emotionally harmful. For a child who's um, linguistically sophisticated enough to understand this is why we're doing this, um, it's very hard to get to a bathroom and I know you could succeed but um, that may be something that you can navigate. Um, if you are with a child who will be very upset about failure and you know your child's limitations, then being in underwear um, and having an accident could be worse. Honestly, I think this is a, a really important question for your child's specific temperament and figuring out which the least of the evils would be, frankly. It could be a setback psychologically, not necessarily permanently, but it could be impactful to their, their self-esteem. But only you know which child yours is and what will be the least harmful. So it's more like emotional it's instead of like physically, as if I have to take him back to China. And it's the, all the trip, like 14 hours plus the, the trip to the airport, to go to the gate, all those probably would take 20 some hours. And right. There's quite so, a few of time, there's probably no bathroom accessible. So then the question is, physically, in terms of the learning process, how confusing is it? I think it depends on where you're at. If you have an 18-month-old who you've managed to potty train, I think it would be more confusing than the three-year-old, um, but maybe less harmful to their self-esteem. Um, and so I think it, it's, the answer is maybe. That it may be a that it may be a setback. Um, it also depends if your child really didn't mind being in diapers that much, 
but everything else was there and you were able to move forward because they noticed it, um, then that may be a child who you set back further because they never really minded that much and they had forgotten how easy it was to go in diapers versus a child who really didn't want to be her her 14 month old that we were talking about who really didn't want to be in diapers but wasn't ready in all other ways and then it probably wouldn't be as much of a setback. It just depends but you've got to do what you got to do. I mean parenthood is a marathon, not a sprint and it's all harm reduction, right? Because nothing's going to be perfect so you need to do what you need to do and that's okay. So I heard you said earlier to that lady uh, about sit with the diaper. So is that a pretty good process uh, to right now let her let her like uh, pull with a diaper on in the potty is a good process. So if kids, the question is, is pooing on a diaper generally good? I'm um, not cost effective, but um, so I think that for children who are having a hard time catching on to the association, um, that the association that the place where their poo used to be, they see and then can put in the new place can be really helpful. But it's not necessary for all children, but for some it can be helpful. Yeah, like right now, I just like af after poo, I put him in the potty. I said, Let's go sit, and he will, he will sit. Sometimes even himself after poo, he will say, oh, sit. So he sit there after. So sometimes I can see his face. If he start turning that, should I just put him there with a the diaper on everything on? So. Yeah, I would say if I were given the choice between you already pooed, which is, is what I'm hearing, if it's you already pooed, now you sit on the potty, versus I see you're going to poo, I'm teaching you that that's something you do on the potty with your diaper still on, I would choose option number two. Because I wouldn't want it to feel like a punishment. You sit on the potty and he's thinking, Nothing more is going to happen, Mom. I already pooed. Um, and why am I sitting here? Um, I think it would be more helpful to proactively teach him the process. Any, anywhere. I can put it in the potty anywhere. Just next to him. Okay, let's go. You can put it anywhere. You can put it in the front yard. You can bring it to the park. Uh, <laughs> bring it on the plane. Your next door neighbor will love you. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Whatever is convenient for him and comfortable for you. Absolutely. The pot, have potty, will travel. That's my motto. <laughs> That's going to be viral on the web. Okay. Uh, I have a 10 month son and uh, he's very happy and active. Uh, my wife uh, sort of plans and manipulates his point time. Like uh, he says, okay, I'm going to give such and such food to him and then uh, we'll let him run all over the uh, living room. And then uh, he says, okay, one, two, three, he's going to go. And then he, he goes in the corner and stands and says, Forces and tennis red and like then okay change, time to change the diaper. So planning uh, for uh, and timing the poo is is it something that helps uh, the the baby to be to a toilet train? And the second part of my question is that is forcing and turning red is normal or is it typical? <laughs> so I'm fascinated by this question, which I may need to clarify. Mommy schedules baby's poo? Yeah, it says, okay, tonight I'm going to give pet, for example. Pet has a lot of fiber and knows, uh, you know, if uh, having him uh, pears uh, and uh, fiber bread or whatever, uh, and let him run all over for, for half an hour, uh, she times it and says, okay, now I'm, I'm sure he's going to be in five minutes. So, so now mom, so mom, who seems to be some sort of voodoo mm -hmm. toddler nutritionist, um, so, so mom, is she telling him poo now, no, or no. she's anticipating she by his say, timing and actions? Anything. She just anticipates what uh, he's uh, intaking. Uh, he, he tells me, uh, she tells me that, uh, okay, I give him such and such food, He's going to play around, to be active, and the, his, in five minutes he's going to poo, and the, his, she's most of the time right. And when he poos, sorry, he's pooing where? Uh, he's pooing in his diaper. But mom's like, count it in five, four, <laughs> three, Houston, poo, right? No, but he he's. Say I mean, no, but mom can yeah, see this happening. Okay, okay. Um, so, in general routine, um, routine, kids, great. So, you will find then 
that if you were, my suspicion is, if you were to slide a potty under him every time mom was doing the cut down, he'd poo in the potty. Because at 10 months old, he probably doesn't have a lot of associations around it. And there's a whole school of training around thinking about what you put in your young infant and offering opportunity when you, you being mom in this case, sees signs, sees grimacing, sees, sees any bodily tension building essentially. Um, there's a whole school around this elimination process and putting them in the environment, putting them over a hole in the ground, for example, saves a whole lot on diapers. Um, what I would say to that is it's not harmful if you're not forcing him into a situation where he must go on the potty um, and you will get success a lot of the time if mom is that attuned to his cues and it may facilitate the process because if you have him going on the potty if you if you were for example to bring over a potty um, and you put the diaper there immediately when he goes for example or you just hold him over the potty and he weren't stressed in any way, which he probably wouldn't be at this age, you're one step closer, but it probably won't get you around the process of training because at this point it's mom recognizing his cues rather than him recognizing his cues. And the forcefulness, so I care a whole lot more about what comes out than about the effort that precedes it. Um, in particular, you may all remember with the young babies, um, and a refresher for the one that's on the way, um, that at a certain point, they go from everything flying through them effortlessly, explosions, to doing the most constipated baby on the block um, face, which is the result of their, which you've all seen, um, which is, and maybe made at times, but that's a different talk. So, um, so they have muscles, sphincters at the bottom of their, their colon, um, which gain tone over the period of the first several weeks well before they're able to actually coordinate the pushing or what we call a valsalva maneuver of trying to make a bowel movement, whereas we can have our legs on the ground, can relax our pelvic floor and push and open up. Um, young infants can't do that. Now at 10 months, I would be a little bit more concerned about what it comes out as. A one month old, they're never actually constipated. They're just always doing this because they haven't figured out how to push and open, push, push and against a closed door. Your 10 month old, I really want to know that when it comes out, it's soft. And if it's soft when it comes out, mushy, not hard little pebbles, not um, a spot of blood on the outside, not a little fissure or a crack around the anus, um, then that's fine that he's doing that. He is very good at imitating, like the very first uh, wellness checkup we went to the, the, his pediatrician and the, his pediatrician told us that, uh, you know, the babies uh, know how to push but they, they don't know how to relax and they, he was imitating the action several times and I, I <laughs> right, and they, then uh, at home I did the same thing, I said, push, relax, push, relax. And then uh, I think he, he may, maybe is imitating me and the pediatrician that, uh, you know, uh, imitating push. And then I said, ah, relax, relax. <laughs> mm. Let's give him something else entertaining to do, shall we? <laughs> this child could be a whole lot of fun in a party. Um, <laughs> but I'm not worried. An answer to your question of the, um, of the comic baby uh, and his desire to imitate, as long as he um, has soft poos when he's all done and he's not actually truly backing up, then <clears throat> on occasion, one one strains a little bit with pooing um, just to get it all to move forward, and that's okay. Thank you. Put yeah. Him Put him on. <laughs> I have a quick question. So, okay. My daughter is almost three, and you know, she, she indicates that she wants to poo, but she'll walk to the bathroom and she doesn't want any of us around. She can't close the door. I don't know what to make of it. It's, it's, uh, what happens? So, so we have a. a private daughter, young daughter. So what, what happens, at, what is the result of her special time in the bathroom? She does poo. She, she poos. She go on the body, she'll just stand and do it. And so she'll poo somewhere in the bathroom? No, no, diaper. Oh, wait, so, okay, so she's not, she's not yet potty trained, no, thus no, your no. attendance here. Okay, so I'm uh, catching on. <laughs> so, so, so she just wants to go in the bathroom and then she yeah. poos in her diaper. Yeah. And then what does she do? And then she comes out and she walks out, she doesn't want to be changed, she's comfortable with it. You know, that's great. She's made an association between 
the bathroom and where one goes poo. I think that's fantastic. I think you congratulate her. And, um, and then I guess my next question is whether any of the other signs of readiness are there. Certainly not the one about wanting to have it taken off. Um, if there's anything else there to build on, then you could, no. That's why I was suggesting iPhone on the body for a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, let's, yes, let's do that. No, um, so I guess I would say I would praise her for acknowledging mm -hmm. that link. Um, and then I would put a diaper on yourself and show her take, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I suppose you could. <laughs> um, so um, I think that I would wait for a window where she, where you offer her, because it doesn't sound like she's ready. You, otherwise, if she were ready, I would tell you, tell her, this is the time when, it doesn't sound like she's there. This might be a time to say, Whenever you would like, we can show you how the poo goes into the potty, like when mommy does it, um, and just acknowledge that she's made that association with the bathroom. You're absolutely right. That's where we go to the bathroom. And then next, we're going to learn how to leave it in the bathroom. Um, but I wouldn't push too much more than that. I would ask her, does she want her own, I don't know, if she has her own potty, yeah, yeah. yeah and all of that. But they don't make diapers which get uncomfortable after things go in there. I know. It's, well, they, they, they do. They're called cloth diapers. Um, <laughs> and yeah, you should, we should, this is totally so modern, post-contemporary. We're going to make cloth diapers. No one will ever have heard of them. Um, yes, no, so, 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 I mean, that, that is one thought is that the super absorbent diapers sure have made it easy to not mind that much. I know, like right now, I'm wearing a diaper, and I haven't even minded for the past hour because it's so. <laughs> don't put that. Um, thanks. <laughs> you guys deserve a prize, like a survivor thing. <laughs> is that still in vogue? Is this still is there a potty survivor? I mean, these are just the people who are too polite to leave. All done. All done. More. No more. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Aww.